The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. My friends, Ireland's hour has come. You have something to give to the world, and that is a future of peace with freedom. When John F. Kennedy became the first sitting U.S. president to visit Ireland, it wasn't simply a trip to retrace his family roots. In what would become the president's final foreign excursion, he called on Ireland to play its role to help preserve world peace. We'll look back on those four days in the Emerald Isle and how his Irish visit would jumpstart a strengthening of ties between our two nations, next on JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Matt Porter. Welcome to JFK 35. In the summer of 1963, President John F. Kennedy visited Ireland, the ancestral home of his eight great-grandparents. The visit would be the first time a sitting American president came to Ireland. President Kennedy made several key stops across the country. Crowds lined up along roads throughout his journey, cheering him as a favorite son, the first Irish Catholic president of the United States. Kennedy visited his family's homestead in Dungenstown in the county of Wexford. I want to express uh, my pleasure at being uh, back uh, from uh, whence I came. There is an impression in Washington that there are no Kennedys left in Ireland, that they're all in Washington. There, the president, accompanied by his sisters Jean Candy Smith and Eunice Candy Shriver, met with his second cousin, Mary Ryan, who lived on their great-grandfather's homestead with her two daughters, Josie and Mary Ann. Tables of cakes and sandwiches were served, and locals dubbed it the largest tea party in the history of Dungenstown. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong uh, desire for liberty. And I'm glad to say, and I'm glad to say, that all of his great-grandchildren have valued that inheritance. While in Wexford, Kennedy said the Irish's strength of spirit could be an example for other countries under the thumb of authoritarian regimes. And therefore, those who may feel that in these difficult times, who may believe that freedom may be on the run, or that some nations may be permanently subjugated and eventually wiped out, would do well to remember Ireland. In addition to being the first sitting president to visit Ireland, John F. Kennedy was the first foreign leader to speak to both houses of the Eructus, or the Irish Parliament. Cameras were allowed in the chamber for the first time to capture his address. Kennedy began his speech with a presentation of the flag of the 69th Infantry Regiment of New York, also known as the Irish Brigade. The 1,200 men who wore a green sprig in their hats fought in Fredericksburg, Maryland on one of the deadliest battlefields of the American Civil War. That day, only 280 men of the regiment survived. Kennedy recognized their bravery and commitment to freedom. In response, he told the Irish Parliament that America stood with the Republic of Ireland and its people. No people ever believed more deeply in the cause of Irish freedom than the people of the United States. And no country contributed more to building my own than your sons and daughters. They came to our shores in a mixture of hope and agony. And I would not underrate the difficulties of their course once they arrived in the United States. They left behind hearts, fields, and a nation yearning to be free. Because Britain retained control of Northern Ireland, it was diplomatically sensitive for a U.S. president to address the issue of Irish independence. And yet, 
Kennedy said he was honored to be welcomed into the free parliament of a free Ireland. He had high hopes for the country to become a leader among nations in the honorable work to preserve peace in the world. I am glad, therefore, that Ireland is moving in the mainstream of current world events. For I sincerely believe that your future is as promising as your past is proud, and that your destiny lies not as a peaceful island in a sea of troubles, but as a maker and a shaper of world peace. Just as President Kennedy spoke to Americans about their agency to make good things happen, his hopes for the people of Ireland echoed a similar message. It is that quality of the Irish, the remarkable combination of hope, confidence, and imagination that is needed more than ever today. The problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the obvious realities. We need men who can dream of things that never were and ask why not. Those four days in Ireland would be memorable ones for the president. The traditional welcome in Ireland was Cade Mille Falcha, or 100,000 welcomes. On his trip with Irish citizens lining the streets and peering their heads out of windows trying to get a look at the president, Kennedy would say at the end of his trip how much the warm welcome meant to him. His remarks on the last day in Galway seemed eerily prescient, as this would be his last foreign trip before his assassination five months later. So I must say that uh, though other days may not be so bright as we look towards the future, that the brightest days will continue to be those in which we visited you here in Ireland. Joining me now is Professor Marion Casey, a historian of Irish and Irish-American history from New York University. Professor Casey trained at both the University of Dublin and NYU and is familiar with the Irish experience from both the Irish and American perspectives. Marion, thank you for joining me today. Well, you're very welcome. So, Marion, we want to talk a little bit about President Kennedy, um, his obviously his Irish visit and sort of his relationship with Ireland and just in general, the American presidency's relationship with Ireland. All right. President Kennedy was the first Irish Catholic to be elected president. How did the people of Ireland react to that news? They were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. It came at a particularly new dawn for Ireland itself from modern Ireland. So it's coinciding with sort of an economic turnaround and a recognition by the United Nations and world powers that Ireland you know, was a legitimate nation and had, could play some kind of a role on the world stage. And so, yeah, having one of their own make it to the White House at just that particular moment was you know, fantastic for the image of Ireland in America and, and sort of a confirmation of self-worth in Ireland itself, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, he would be the first sitting president to visit Ireland in 1963. Obviously, that was a tremendous event for the people of Ireland. Can you describe the excitement for it um, from the Irish perspective? What did it mean for them to have President Kennedy visit? Well, there's a number of ways to look at it. It was seen by his own extended family as a homecoming. Right. But the Kennedys had had a relationship with Ireland Prior to 63, I believe John F. Kennedy himself visited Ireland while the family was based in London. Joe Kennedy did not go to Ireland, but I think Joe Jr. and John F. Kennedy went and toured around, maybe with one of their sisters too. You'd have to look that up to be sure. And um, he had written a piece on uh, De Valera and Ireland in 1945 that was published in the New York Journal American. So it's, you know, somewhere in his consciousness, Ireland existed. So for his extended family, it was a homecoming. For the average Irish man and woman, it was the arrival of a, a celebrity in a way. It was a major social event in the country. 
uh, we have in the Archives of Irish America at New York University a flag that was thrown out of the window of a house along his parade route. You know, it just is a portrait of Kennedy. So the the average person was invested in this. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why. Part of it was his youth and charm, I am sure. Um, part of it was the prestige of the office that he represented. Part of it was that almost everybody in Ireland at, in 1963 had a had family, extended family in the United States. So the connection between the two countries was intimate from the perspective of family history. So by extension, he was a returning family member, even though they, they weren't exactly related to him. You know what I mean? And Ireland had this unique situation, right, where a number, like a significant part of its population had left to other countries. So maybe unlike other countries President Kennedy visit, there was this unique sort of diaspora connection between him, his family in America, and then his extended family in Ireland. Yeah, I believe in one of the stops he made in Ireland, it actually might have been in uh, New Ross. Uh, he said, he looks out over the harbor and he says, well, if my family hadn't emigrated, I'd probably be employed right over there right now. You know, like this understanding that the decision to leave Ireland in previous generations had changed the trajectory of his life. Right. I think um, right on the tarmac in Dublin, when he landed, his first you know remarks to the country uh, in Ireland, Kennedy pointed out that all eight of his great grandparents had left um, Ireland during the uh, famine crisis, most within months of each other. He noted that the Irish in America and their other adopted countries became very devoted citizens. How do you think that played in Ireland, that portrait of the Irish abroad? I think that uh, for most people in Ireland in 19, the 1950s and the 1960s, you're looking at a, uh, a society in which the vast majority of young people came of age and left the country. So you're in a, on an island where you have those who have been basically left behind in a static economy and a very, very con socially conservative environment. And they get all these glowing letters from abroad. They have siblings and cousins who come home uh, wearing the American army uniform, during, especially during the um, Korean War, when they, you have a lot of Irish, um, newly naturalized Irish citizens based in Germany. And they get leave and they come to visit their family in Ireland. And so there's a pride. There's a pride in that our brothers and sisters and our cousins have done well in America. And they are, you know, serving proudly in the United States Army, for example. So more of a pride than sort of like a feeling of missing these people. What could they have done had they stayed? It was, it was much more of a pride. Yes. Ireland's on a path towards what you're describing, but that doesn't come until maybe the 1960s. And again, it really comes in in the late 80s, but it's a different phenomena. In the 1960s, we're talking about something entirely different. It was more a, a an almost, um, this may not play very well with listeners, but it's almost a wishful thinking that maybe I should have gone to America too. Mm, interesting. And, you know, I think this touches on it, but there was, you know, such such an outpouring of love or cheering or excitement for his visit. Um, and then the morning, not long uh, after, you know, President Kennedy was assassinated, this was his last foreign trip. You touched on it a bit, but I'll ask it more directly. Why was there so much sort of love for Kennedy and his success as, you know, he wasn't an Irish president. He wasn't an Irish figure. He was an American figure. I think it does go back to um, uh, the youthfulness and his his skill we are in a media age we're en entering a media age in the united states and he was very um telegenic and he had a um a good rapport with the press so he made a good impression television in ireland was in its absolute infancy in 63 a brand new national television network had just started but they didn't it wasn't fully rolled out so they had to borrow cameras and um, equipment and personnel from the BBC in order to cover this journey in Ireland. And um, the historian Rob Savage at Boston College has done uh, some um, writing on this aspect of it. But so, it, it, in other words, people who didn't actually see Kennedy in person in Ireland 
saw him on television in a new medium. So it was, it was incredibly exciting. Two, two things, the confluence of two things are happening at that time. You know, the arrival of the president of the United States and also the arrival of television um, in the country. Mm, which sort of is the story of JFK's presidency. He is the first real television president. You know, and then as like there was so much love among sort of, you know, everybody watching this. And he was the uh, he was invited to speak at the Houses of the Oireachtas. Uh, which is the Irish Parliament, uh, similar to our Congress, um, the first foreign head of state to speak there. Um, and again, as you mentioned, television, television cameras were allowed in there uh, for the first time to cover that speech. And the question is, did a lot of Irish politicians try to take sort of advantage of the Kennedy wave and kind of like find ways to connect themselves, you know, an effort to sort of maybe capitalize on that incredible excitement for this figure? I feel like as I watched the... Um, archives it seems like everybody wanted to make sure that they kind of got a picture with president kennedy you know at mayor level whatever political level if they could just you know get up on stage and be in the background like that was something that was valuable yeah i think the greatest thing is it was very um heavily male dominated all the ceremonies um and um the lord mayor of limerick really wanted in on it and she was a woman and she she had every legitimate right because on um, John F. Kennedy's mother's side, the Fitzgeralds were from Ruff County Limerick. So she made sure that she got an extra stop added in on his way out of the country. So, so in that sense, yeah, every, it was, I'm not sure that it did her huge game had, had any traction mm -hmm. for her politically, but certainly it, reminded everybody uh, that, uh, you know, there are women in the country and also that he was Irish on his mother's side and that from a different part of Ireland. But, I, you know, the thing about the emphasis on the Kennedys and Wexford is because of uh, John Barry, who's, you know, Kennedy was a naval man and the one of the founders of the United States Navy is uh, Commodore John Barry. So, and Barry was from Wexford. So that it's kind of natural that the orientation shifted there but it's very nice that um, uh, Rose Fitzgerald's side was acknowledged on that trip uh, before he left. And I think also, you know, the symbolism of what the gifts that were given is, is really telling. Um, Limerick, we, that we've just been talking about, Limerick gave Kennedy a 14th century treaty between the Earl of Ormond and the O. Kennedys, you know, which was basically settled the terms of their disputes, which included, you know, pillage and murder and stuff like that mm -hmm. in the 14th century. But that's a precious document of Irish history. And in return, you know, Kennedy presents to Ireland a precious talisman, if you will, of uh, Irish America, which is the battle flag of the 69th Regiment, uh, New York State Militia. Oh, that's real interesting. So as we start to move now, connecting this to the current times, uh, the first thing is, do you think there was a difference sort of forever change between the Irish-American relationship prior to Kennedy's election and then after? Do you, do you think it was so significant that there's sort of a before Kennedy time and a after Kennedy time that can be met, that can be seen? Do you mean in Ireland or in America? In Ireland. Was the relationship between the two countries sort of different before Kennedy and sort of after Kennedy? Uh, yes. And um, Kennedy helps remove sort of a, a um, international political stain that Ireland um, acquired during the Second World War when it chose to stay neutral and not allow um, American or British forces to use some of their ports. So there was some kind of bad blood floating around in, in, the, in that transatlantic relationship. Uh, Kennedy, Kennedy basically tells Ireland that, um, you know, he's on his way back from Berlin where he gave that historic speech. And he tells Ireland that even though they're small, that they have a role to play in Europe and in, um, in the Atlantic Alliance. So it opens the door. He also, before his death, sets up the, I think it's the American Ireland Fund, which was to strengthen the bonds the cultural bonds between Ireland and America. So exchange of artists and, you know, visiting scholars and that type of thing. So that was very helpful too. And that continues to, to this day, a very important philanthropic um, initiative 
that has just grown and um, is very important for Ireland and and the United States. Oh yes, the other thing that Kennedy um, Kennedy's legacy is that now, since then, almost every president, probably every president, has visited Ireland. Nixon goes, Bush goes, Reagan, Clinton. Clinton goes multiple times because he's involved in the Northern Ireland peace process. George W. Bush, Barack Obama went, and President Trump went. So, you know, you mentioned now with Biden being the second uh, Irish Catholic president. Apparently, Mr. President Biden wrote you and the uh, students at Glocksman House at NYU a letter, and uh, I think you want to read a little bit about it for us. Yes, uh, we were very honored to receive uh, just under a month after his inauguration last year in 2021. Um, he wrote. Um, this, and I'll just uh, read a couple of paragraphs from it. Dear friends, I write to you as a descendant of the Bluets of, from County Mayo and the Finnegans of County Louth, of an Irish American family that imbued in me a sense of pride that spoke of both continents, a heart and soul that drew from old and new, a pride in community, faith, and above all, family. All these years later, I write to you from a White House designed by an Irish hand in a nation where Irish blood was spilled in revolution for independence and in preservation of the union. And the bridge between the two nations goes back and forth, growing wider and more necessary with every year that passes. Linked in memory and imagination and joined by our histories, we are nostalgic for the future. So it was then, so it is now. And to the students of Glucksman Ireland House, I look forward to working with you as well. You are part of one of the most gifted, tolerant, and talented generations ever. As your ancestors were before you, be at once dreamers and realists, compassionate yet demanding, embrace our inter interdependence, and be sustained by a spirit of resilience, peace, and possibility. This is your time to write the next great chapter of two great nations and two great friends. Sincerely, uh, Joe Biden, P.S., the son of Catherine Eugenia Finnegan. Oh, that's really nice. And, uh, yeah. you know, listening to that, I want to just say like, and you can respond to this, but, you know, Biden, like President Kennedy, um, sort of illustrates the Irish diaspora, the Irish Americans here um, in a certain way. Um, he, you know, he mentions their, you know, hardworking nature. And he also doesn't forget in this letter that you just wrote, read to note the Irish sacrifices that have been made um, mm -hmm. Tell, tell just why don't you can you reflect a little bit about like why he wrote it and the way he did because it, it feels very similar to the way Kennedy spoke um 60 years ago yeah uh it is Kennedy uh in his speech to the Oireachtas when he presented the um the um the flag of the fighting 69th um uh, talked about sacrifices especially during the American Civil War and I do think you know it's acknowledging the role of immigrants in the United States uh, which is very important, and um, which is contributions and patriotism. So it has been a a long theme in Irish American history that you could be uh, loyal to the United States as well as loyal to Ireland. Um, that the two the two positions are not irreconcilable, and I think he's pointing to that. And uh, you know, you mentioned this peace process that happened with Clinton. Would America have had the same role or standing with Ireland? You know, had those foundations not started with Kennedy um, for Clinton to be able to play that role um, thirty years later? I mean, I think it's very interesting. Kennedy does not go to Northern Ireland in '63. He's he just visits the Republic of Ireland, and it's a very tense time because the 1950s uh, there's a campaign in Ireland to remove the border. So he, he he doesn't he doesn't politicize his visit in those because of those uh, those issues between Britain and Ireland. He steers clear of it. But uh, yes, I think that certainly the interest having a an American president with an Irish heritage is potential political leverage for Ireland in in their relationship with Great Britain during the 80s, especially and 90s. And you know today. You know, there are so many Irish immigrants you can point to that are in positions of power um, here in Boston. Marty Walsh, now the secretary of labor, uh, President Joe Biden is obvious example right now. If you go across the United States, you find Irish leadership in political roles, um, CEOs, private, public, um, non-governmental. Does that still have like um, 
give Ireland a sort of pride uh, that there are so many successful Irish immigrants over here. And to add, what do you think both sides hope for the relationship going forward? I think that there has been a, a sea change in Irish America since the 60s. It is less predictably a, an ethnic voting bloc that is reliably democratic. It's far more 50-50, the split between uh, Republican and Democratic. That also reflects different values. And in many respects, contemporary Ireland is far more progressive than contemporary Irish America, be it Democrat or Republican. They've kind of Flipped. gone in different, they've gone in different, yeah, mm-hmm. they've gone in different routes. Because as you mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, when JFK was visiting Ireland in 1960, you know, the people who were left who hadn't immigrated were sort of a much more conservative population. And maybe you could say in America, at least you found more um, Democrats among the Irish than you did Republican during the 60s. And now you're kind of saying that that's a bit flipped. Mm -hmm. But also in the election of 1960, you, you... You can't say that every Irish American voted for John F. Kennedy. Uh, He had great support among the first generation, the immigrant generation who had arrived in the 50s and maybe in the 1920s. But for those who are third, fourth, fifth generation and have assimilated and acculturated, you know, a lot of them were beginning to vote um, Republican from. So it's under Eisenhower, you begin to see a little bit of uh, a tilt towards the Republican Party and then and then. And now it's basically 50-50 split. Hmm. So what do you think both countries can hope for the relationship going forward? Well, it will be very interesting given Brexit. And it's unknown, really. Um, I I think the bonds of friendship between Ireland and the United States will continue. The Irish government of the Republic of Ireland is very intent on uh, fostering artistic and cultural exchanges. Um, encouraging uh, Americans to visit Ireland. And I think that will continue very uh, robustly into the future. On a political level, it really depends on what happens with, um, uh, you know, we have some tense situations with NATO and, um, um, you know, the, with, there are factors at play, like in the United Nations, uh, Ireland just sat on the Security Council last year. And, you know, we we'll have to see what develops with Brexit. Uh, because uh, their Brexit affects the border on the island of Ireland. That will be a challenge for whichever president is in office. Whichever president is in mm-hmm. office. Um, yeah, because that has the potential to uh, be quite combustible mm-hmm. um, if it's not handled carefully. Indeed. And the last question I want to mention comes from an anecdote that I don't know if you've heard, but I'm, you know, my family is Irish. Uh, my grandparents um, were children of Irish immigrants. And sort of the joke between like Irish Americans or even people in Ireland after Kennedy was elected president is that most Irish people have three frame photos, uh, portraits, which is they have one of the Pope, one of Jesus Christ, and one of John F. Kennedy. So that kind of symbolizes the strength of the Irish connection in the 60s. Do the middle age and younger age Irish citizens who were never alive during Kennedy's presidency, do you think they still have that same affection, that strong affection that sort of is emblematic by that little anecdote? We would first have to say it's um, when you say Jesus Christ is particularly the sacred heart. Yes. Yes, the Sacred Heart. Yep. So you have the Pope, the Sacred Heart, and John F. Kennedy. No, I think popular culture has sort of um, um, begun to obscure Kennedy for the contemporary young people. They, you know, if you ask them, the first person that comes to mind when they hear the word Irish, it is now one of the Irish boxers, maybe, or one of the Irish golfers. It's not John F. Kennedy. He's yeah. lost that air of celebrity he had in the 60s. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of time has passed and mm-hmm. uh, young people, you know, they get connected to Irish in very different ways. And mm-hmm. it's not through politics anymore. Well, despite that, you still believe the Irish-American relationship will remain very strong uh, from the foundations. Yeah, I, I think there is um, um, there is interest. I see it in my in the students who enroll in my classes. 
you know, they're interested in Ireland. It's what we call late generation ethnicity. After several, you know, they get curious about why their name is, you know, Sullivan or why their grandparents were the children of immigrants. What does that mean? What does it mean? Ireland, uh, you know, Irish is, has been so heavily commercialized that it's reduced to this caricature. It, yeah, really irrelevant. But the history is quite rich, and some people do come back to it that way. And I do think that from in that strand will uh, help um, shore up the relationship bet between the two islands. So, sorry, the two nations. Yeah, it's not all lost. It's not all lost at all. Well, um, Professor Casey, thank you for um, taking some time to talk to us today. It was um, really enlightening to learn a little bit more about the Irish side of things. Um, you know, over here at the Candy Library, we certainly know um, the administration side of the story, but really nice to get a little more um, context of that visit. You're very welcome. You're very welcome, Matt. It's a pleasure. If you are interested in learning more about President Kennedy's trip to Ireland, you can visit our podcast page at jfklibrary.org forward slash jfk35. On the page, we'll include links to photos, audio, and video from the trip. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great day.